Zelensky says Ukraine has retaken more than 1,000 settlements from Russian forces. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky say Ukraine has retaken six settlements from Russian forces on Friday, and 1,015 overall since the start of the conflict in February. We continued to restore the de-occupied territories of Ukraine. As of today, 1,015 settlements have been de-occupied, which is plus six in the past 24 hours, he said in his nightly address. It is unclear exactly how much territory those settlements constitute. Zelensky did outline other gains by Ukraine's military in those areas. We return electricity, water supply, communications, transport, social services there, he said. He also stated that the gradual liberation of Kharkiv region proves that Ukraine will not leave anyone to the enemy. Ukrainian lawmaker says situation on battlefield is far worse than it was at the start of war. A Ukrainian lawmaker called on the United States to provide air defense systems and fighter jets to Ukraine, saying that the situation on the battlefield is far worse than it was at the beginning of the war. It is hell on the front lines right now, Oleksandr Estinova told reporters at a German Marshall Fund roundtable in Washington Friday. We keep losing many more men now than it was at the beginning of the war. Daria Kaliniuk, a leading Ukrainian civil society activist, explained we can't win this war with Soviet equipment because a. Russia has much more Soviet equipment, b. We don't have anywhere to get ammunition for this, and c. Russia simply has more people and more troops, Ustinova said Ukraine no longer seeks the Soviet air MiG fighter jets because the war has changed. Instead, she said Ukraine needs the multiple launch rocket system, MLRS, pallet and self propelled howitzers, and fighter jets like the F 16s in order to effectively counter Russia, and called on the U.S. to begin training Ukrainian pilots to use such jets. Kaliniuk, who said she recently met with Ukrainian defense officials in Kyiv, noted that Ukraine has combat experienced pilots, who are willing and ready to go now for trainings. They were willing to go yesterday for trainings. But there is no decision to accept them and to provide that because there is no decision to provide fighter jets. The U.S. has begun to send heavy weaponry to Ukraine, but has yet to give them MLRS or fighter jets. Ustinova and Kaliniuk, who were in Washington this week for meetings, said that they believe there is a lack of political will that is needed for the administration to decide to send such kinds of heavy weaponry, and quickly and the feeling that there is still fear about provoking Moscow. They decried the fact that it took so long for the U.S. to decide to send the heavy weaponry it is sending now, with us Sonova saying, if we had howitzers two months ago, Mariupol would not happen because they wouldn't be able to surround like they did, to surround the city and literally destroy it. For us time means lives, thousands of lives. We've been hearing that it has been unprecedented how fast everything is moving and how fast the decisions are taking. But there has never been a war since World War II like that. And unfortunately, we keep asking here to take the decisions faster, she said. Difficult negotiations continue on evacuating badly wounded from Azovstal, Ukrainian official says. Difficult negotiations are continuing over the fate of Ukrainian soldiers still trapped in the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol, Pavlo Kirilenko, head of Donetsk Region Military Administration, said. Difficult negotiations are underway, and they are still going on at this time, in order to save the defenders, gradually, because the Russian Federation is trying to dictate its conditions and requirements as much as possible. Therefore, in the first place, it will be seriously wounded fighters, he said. Kirilenko echoed the comments of Ukraine's deputy prime minister Irina Vershchuk that the Ukrainian side would not offer detailed comments about the process. We have to talk about it only when people will be safe. Only then we shall give any comments. Negotiations are ongoing and they are really very difficult. Because, first, the Russian Federation always changes them, the conditions. And even those agreements that are reached are not a 100% agreement with Russia, he explained. In the meantime, he said, the Russians continued to attack Havistal from the air.
These are heavy, vacuum, high explosive bombs, the official said. Verschuk has also been speaking about the Azov Sul negotiations, apparently seeking to tamp down expectations. There are no miracles in war. There are harsh realities. Therefore, only a sober and pragmatic approach works, she said Friday. The team is working. Negotiations with the enemy are very difficult. The result may not please everyone. But our task is to get our boys out. Everyone. Alive. U.S. Congress must pass Ukraine aid supplemental by May 19 to ensure no interruptions, Pentagon says. If Congress does not pass the $40 billion Ukraine aid supplemental by May 19, it'll start impacting the United States' ability to provide Ukraine military aid uninterrupted, Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby said during a briefing at the Pentagon on Friday. May 19 is the day we really, without additional authorities, we begin to not have the ability to send new stuff in, Kirby said. By the 19th of May, it'll start impacting our ability to provide aid uninterrupted. The House of Representatives passed the $40 billion supplemental this week, but the Senate failed to pass the bill after Sen. Rand Paul blocked its passage. Paul, a Republican from Kentucky, wanted more oversight of how the funds will be spent before agreeing to let the bill go to the Senate floor for a vote. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has started procedural steps to override Paul's objection, but the bill likely won't pass until next week at the earliest. There is still about $100 million left in current presidential drawdown authority funding, Kirby said. That funding has not been allocated or announced yet. He added that we would like to get approval for additional authorities before the third week of this month so that we could continue uninterrupted the flow of aid and assistance into Ukraine, so obviously we continue to urge the Senate to act as quickly as possible so we don't get to the end of May and not have any additional authorities to draw back, to draw upon, Kirby said. Russian general implicated in crimes against civilians in Ukraine and Syria met with UK counterpart in 2017. A Russian general, identified in a CNN investigation as responsible for targeting civilians in the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv and his role as the architect of the siege of Aleppo, was involved in high-level defense talks with his UK counterpart in 2017 after receiving Russia's highest military honor for his role in its war in Syria. Call General Alexander Zervlyov, in his capacity as then Deputy Chief of General Staff, met with the UK's then Vice Chief of Defence Staff General Messenger for high-level talks, during a trip to Moscow in 2017 and what was characterized by the UK's Ministry of Defence as military-to-military -military dialogue. Zervli off discussed with Messenger Restart of Military Interaction, Russian state news agency TASS reported on February 28, 2017, quoting Russia's Ministry of Defence. CNN's investigation found that Zurevlyov's leadership in 2016 catalyzed the assault on eastern Aleppo. After he took the reins, the Russian military rapidly ramped up its attacks on the rebel-held territory and completed the siege of the densely populated city, exacting a large death toll and setting the wheels in motion for a tactic that has defined Russia's intervention in Syria, besiege, starve, bombard and grind into submission. His period of command also saw a dramatic increase in documented cluster munition attacks in Aleppo. European intelligence agency analysts who spoke to CNN on condition of anonymity said the pattern of Zervlyov's behavior in Syria and Ukraine is the same, subjugating cities through terror. Zervlyov was brought in with the purpose of bringing about a swift capitulation of Aleppo. He did that using much of the same methodology we see in Ukraine ordering the indiscriminate use of cluster munitions against dense civilian infrastructure and populations, the analyst said. Syrian human rights activists have long called for Russia's general to be held accountable, and a leading UFK human rights lawyer at the law firm Payne Hicks speech, Matthew Ingham, told CNN, Colonel General Alexander Zervlyov should have been sanctioned for his actions in Syria adding, it is a shame that there was not a stronger response to alleged war crimes at that stage, because that may have affected Putin's Ukrainian strategic calculations from the outset.
Neither the US nor the UK have taken public action against Zervlyov or other key Russian generals implicated in war crimes. The US State Department wouldn't comment on the specific findings of CNN's investigation but said they continued to track and assess war crimes and reports of ongoing violence and abuses. In a statement to CNN, the UK Ministry of Defense said a previous statement issued in 2017 made it clear that they supported military-to-military -military dialogue to minimize risk and miscalculation. We stand by that principle, which is why we gave Russia every opportunity to engage in dialogue this year over Ukraine before they launched their reprehensible and unprovoked invasion, and MOD spokesperson said. What Russian troops left behind on the outskirts of Kharkiv show brutality of war. Two convoys of civilian cars in one northeastern Ukrainian village speak of Russia's retreat from the area and the brutality it left behind. The first, three cars, laden with a priest, dogs and troubled frowns, is headed hurriedly through the village of Star Yi Saltif from the north, fleeing the violence as Ukraine pushes Russian forces out of Rubizhna. We don't even know what's happening, one driver said. We didn't stick around to find out. Ukrainian officials said this week that they continued to push toward the Russian border, liberating tiny villages on the outskirts of Kharkiv, the country's second largest city before the invasion began. The Ukrainian advances threatened the symbolic embarrassment of expelling the Kremlin's forces back to their own border while posing the strategic threat of cutting Russia's supply lines into Ukraine and its forces further south in the Donbas region. The advances have been swift over the past weeks. The second convoy speaks of what Ukraine has found in Russia's wake five vehicles riddled with bullets, two torched to cinders. On May 4, Ukrainian officials have said this convoy was trying to leave the town when it was shot up by Russian troops. The bullet holes concentrate on some of the driver's doors. Children's clothes and toys litter the area around the vehicles. Ukrainian officials said that four civilians, including a 13-year-old girl, were killed when Russian troops opened fire on this convoy. CNN's escorts from the Kharkiv City Territorial Defense Force say a tank shell hit one of the cars, explaining how its front section is twisted beyond recognition. Moscow says its forces don't target civilians, a claim contradicted by evidence of apparent atrocities witnessed by CNN here and elsewhere in Ukraine. Magnets, t-shirts and chocolates show off Ukrainian pride and defiance in Lviv tourist shops. Signs of Ukrainian pride are on display all over downtown Lviv, in everything from the blue and yellow flags hanging on walls to billboards condemning the Russian invasion and celebrating Ukrainian soldiers. In tourist shops in and around the historic downtown of the western Ukrainian city, the national colors are printed on a bevy of items. CNN spoke to Oksana Gorgichik who works in one of those shops. Before the war, tourists would buy souvenirs featuring the city's historic architecture or other local symbols, she said. But since March, her shop began selling products that referenced the conflict, 